coming up on show 734, the clean air currently seen over China, the United States and other places as well as a glimpse into the future. Stick around, I'll tell you more. Plus standalone solar powered EV charging stations, an all electric battery powered bunker tanker. Volvo are going electric and here's how they are testing their batteries. Fastnet have got their results out and why the Model 3 could get even quicker thanks to the Model Y. Those stories and many more coming up on the show today. Well, good morning, good afternoon or good evening. Wherever you're listening around the world, welcome to EV News Daily, the edition for Tuesday, 31st of March. My name is Martin Lee and I go through every EV story so you don't have to. Thank you as always to myev.com in the US. If you are researching EVs, maybe you've discovered this podcast and you're learning about them. Maybe you're a bit of an EV veteran, a bit of an EV nerd, but you always want to see if you know the latest. Check out the latest knowledge which they can help you uh, learn more about EVs at myev.com as well as, of course, buying and selling EVs. Although I'm guessing at the minute there's not too much of that going on uh, between people. Let's crack on with our first story. The COVID-19 outbreak has seen such a big disruption around the world. Manufacturing has slowed down. In some places, it's stopped. Trade has slowed down. In other places, it's going great guns. Look at things like eSports and sim racing and anything online. This podcast is doing pretty well at the minute. I I never want to talk about it too much, but actually, uh, the download stats show that people are at home with more time to listen to podcasts if we're looking for silver linings. Sports events have certainly taken a big hit. However, if we are looking for a silver lining, I've mentioned this a couple of times so far, satellite data show that reduced nitrogen dioxide emissions across big land masses like the United States and China, Europe like Italy and Spain. According to the website paultan.org, California became the first state in the US to issue a shelter-in-place order, effective March 19. And while many cities have made their decision to shut down, according to Gizmodo, many more places are now doing that. Los Angeles did mark a clear reduction before other places, though, because they were the first ones to to shut down, to stay at home, as it were. A clear reduction in pollution because of the city's car culture, which is kind of no longer on the roads at the moment. So the website has noted that in the northeast region, New York City has marked a significant reduction as well in pollutants. In Europe, Italy has seen air quality improvements, along with a reduction in nitrogen dioxide emissions over the span of a month. Data that runs from Feb 8th to March 7th shows that Italy already started to improve their air quality and there's much more of a lockdown in place compared to March 7th. You've got to be slightly careful with these stories that are going around on the internet at the moment. There are some memes on social media. There are some things going around that you need to just be, just to be careful of. Have you seen one going around that says the waters in uh, the canals of Venice are now so clean because there's no boat traffic that dolphins have even returned? No, that's long been debunked, actually. That's been doing the rounds on my Facebook and Twitter. The actual picture was taken years ago, and it wasn't even in Venice. It was somewhere in uh, Europe, but it certainly wasn't... Uh, it might have been Italy, but it certainly wasn't that area, and it was entirely made up. The person who did it has admitted it was faked. Uh, she, I think she's South African. She's refusing to delete the post, even though it continues to be reposted, even though it's false, because she's, it, it draws awareness to pollution issues and besides yes of course she's getting lots of attention from a post that has gone viral that should be deleted have you seen one going around about elephants uh, going into villages because of the lockdown and uh, drinking some sort of tea and getting drunk and falling asleep long debunked as false so there's a lot of things going around on social media at the minute saying oh because of coronavirus there's lots of positive things happening waters are getting clearer all that kind of stuff and it's just not true it hasn't happened that quickly but the air pollution stuff i think has got a fair shout of being a reasonably good story because we can see from the satellite data from very good sources that actually china got cleaner and now that china is resuming manufacturing uh, some of those pollution uh, indicators are going back up again but It is an insight into what it'll be like. A lot of it is down to car traffic and what it'll be like when we're all driving EVs. It cannot come soon enough. It's why I get up every morning and crack on with work on this podcast uh, because I'm interested myself, but I want to bring this news to you. I want to spread the news far and wide about how EVs, not only just better cars and more fun, but also because it's just the right thing to do for the planet not to be burning things. Because after all, they're gonna the things that we burn are gonna run out that is even from climate change deniers 
you can't deny we're going to run out of oil and gas. So why waste time? Why wait until it's the last minute? Get on with it now and drive clean, green, brilliant fun EVs. All right, I'll get off my soapbox now. Uh, let's continue with news about a really cool invention by a company called Envision. And they've got this solar EV arc charging station. Charlotte, North Carolina have purchased four of the solar-powered EV charging stations for public use and city use as well. They're off-grid. They include emergency power. They're solar-powered. And you can even relocate them for city events or emergency power needs. The EV arc are DC fast charging systems. They provide up to 1,100 miles a day. It's a solar-powered electrical generation canopy, and it's got Envision Track technology, so it tracks the sun to generate 25% more electricity than a fixed solar array. The energy is stored in the onboard battery storage for charging, whether it's day or night, and to provide EV charging and emergency power in grid failure situations. The EV Arc by Envision is a permanent solution. It's level 1, level 2, and DC fast charging compatible, but because there's no trenching, there's no foundations, there's no installation work of any kind, you deploy them in minutes and they can be moved to a new location for big public events and things like that. It's a fabulous little invention this. I've never used one personally. Uh, I've only seen the news stories and, and researched it myself, but uh, this looks like a great idea. Okay, so it can't recharge cars constantly all day like a grid-connected system, but for something that is off-grid and solar-powered, this is brilliant. This next story is even better. Japanese marine transportation company, Asahi Tanki, a tanker company, on Friday last week said it's decided to build the world's first two zero-emission electric propulsion bunker tankers. Yeah, and if you're thinking, oh, well, hang on, a tanker, like a bunker tanker that delivers fuel, oh, that's like, that's a massive vessel, and you think of battery-powered marine vehicles, so, you know, smaller day boats, leisure craft, that kind of thing... No, no, no. The, the image you've got in your mind is right. These are big. According to Manifold Times, Asahi states the tankers are going to utilise their current tanker design. Construction is beginning March 2022. First tanker will be on the water March 2023. The vessels are purely battery powered uh, by large capacity lithium ion batteries and they will be used to enter Tokyo Bay as marine fuel supply vessels. These are going to be big tankers uh, carrying, ironically, fossil fuels for other vehicles. Both vessels are designed to run completely on battery power, zero emissions, so free of carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxide, so the NOx and SOx, the dangerous stuff in those, the soot to reduce impact on the health of the crew on board as well. If you look at ships, you look at what's coming out of the top of those chimney stacks and you think about the staff that have to work on the decks of those it's just a crazy thing to even assume that, that that is something that, as humanity, we should put people through. So, great news, battery-powered tankers are coming. Just slightly ironic that they're being used to deliver fossil fuels. Yes, it's not lost on me. <laughs> Let's talk about Volvo. As Volvo goes electric, it's making its batteries top-notch. A really interesting long read by Ars Technica. They've got a quote from Ulrich Persson. Ulrich Persson leads the battery development at Volvo. And Ulrich says this, and I quote, Up until now, we've bought complete battery systems, starting with the BEV, battery electric vehicle. It's a whole different ball game. And of course, with Volvo's pure electric vehicles, with their Recharge XC40, with their Polestar spin-off as well, like the Polestar 2. Uh, Ulrich says, and I quote, Of course it's possible to outsource that as well, working very closely with supplier, but from our side, we felt it was a strategic decision to take ownership of this new component. It's definitely the most expensive component in the vehicle, and it's as integral to the crash structure of the vehicle, and so it really makes sense, end quote. Well, Ars Technica says that their focus at Volvo on making batteries top-notch means that there's no shared components between the different EVs. They make like the cells which go into their Volvo plug-in hybrids. Those are 10.4 kilowatt hour packs. And in the Volvo XC40 Recharge and the Polestar 2, that is a 78 kilowatt hour battery pack. For European and US XC40s, the cells are going to be from LG Chem, they're LG Chem pouch cells, whereas China-bound cars are going to be using prismatic cells from CATL. The rapid pace of development applies equally to software, says Volvo. Witness how many more miles Tesla can eke out of a kilowatt hour today compared to 
when the company started. Well, Pearson confirmed that Volvo is doing the same, using the same approach and collecting as much real-world data from their connected cars and using it to roll out improvements via over-the-air updates. Well, before that stage, he says his team engages in extensive testing of battery tech at the factory. Volvo has a $60 million new in-house battery testing lab, because that's how serious Volvo say they are taking pure battery electric cars. And of course, Volvo were one of the original companies that way back in the day, they were the first major a car maker which said by a certain date 2020 maybe it was all of our cars are going to be electrified i know they, they beat the date they set anyway and when they said electrified okay yeah that does mean have some sort of battery power that doesn't mean full battery electric car but look what they're doing with their spin-off polestar and the polestar 2 which went into production last week in china and what they're doing with their volvo branded cars as well the xc40 recharge not so much quietly, because they are talking about it, but I think they're just getting on with it and making good, interesting cars. Certainly the Polestar 2. Like it looks like a fabulous car. We were talking about it on the Sunday night chat show that I was doing on YouTube uh, with the team at EV Lounge Live. And one of the co-hosts of that show, Nick, has seen it at the motor show up close and personal. He says it feels like you're when you're in the cockpit, you're a fighter pilot, opposite of Tesla, which has that one screen he says that the inside of the Polestar 2 is just a, a place to behold. Loved being inside it. Hey, by the way, uh, we tried it on Sunday night as a brand new live chat show. So three of us as hosts and then a live audience interacting as well and going really big on reading out all of your comments in the live chat. If you want to take part in this Sunday's show, if you're free, if you're on lockdown, if you want to if you want to take part, uh, it's available to view afterwards, by the way. Just head on to YouTube and click on EV Lounge or EV Lounge Live. Both will find it. Uh, one show up there. It was meant to be a test, a private test, but we made it public because we thought, well, it went all right. Uh, if you can subscribe to that channel, uh, we'd love to have you a subscriber. Hit a little bell icon so you can get notifications of when we go live. It's a completely live show, so bear that in mind. It's every Sunday night, and it's going to be at 2 o'clock Eastern, which is 7 p.m. here in the UK. Now we're on British summer times. So it's 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. UK. If you want to have some time on Sunday watching a few people talk and chat about EVs for half an hour, 45 minutes, I would invite you to to join us live every Sunday. European charging company Fastnet have released their 2019 results, and it just reveals the high growth of EVs. The Dutch fast charging network closed last year with revenues of 6.4 million euros, out of which 4.5 million euros was related directly to charging, says Inside EVs. Over the last year, the company delivered 8 gigawatt hours of electricity. That's a 175% increase on the previous year. Had 43,000 active customers, up 140% on the previous year. The growth looks amazing. The ongoing expansion is reflected in losses, 12 million euros of losses, because they are expanding rapidly and investing. The network consists of 114 Fastned stations installed in the Netherlands, in Germany. There's a single station here in the UK, isn't there? There's a Scotland has a station. Uh, the average revenue per charging station is 40,000 euros a year, in case you're wondering if any of these charging station companies are actually making any money. The revenue from each of their charging stations, 40k a year. Average of 70 megawatt hours a year of electricity. Wonder how that compares to all the other charging networks. Not that I imagine too many of them get as granular with their uh, their data. I mean, one of the reasons I love Fastnet, by the way, they're really active in the community. They're always really active on social media, replying to people. When someone will tweet them and say, like, what's the charging curve of so-and-so car? They'll often reply because they've got all the data. So they'll know that a, for instance, a so-and-so EV turned up at 10% and how long they charged for, what the charge speed was, and they'll often put charge curves on their, their social media to see when the when the car tapers down and it slows the charge. Of course, EVs charge slower as they get more full, if you're new to the podcast and uh, and, uh, and you're wondering why I was saying that. So I, I really I really rate far I don't know anyone there. I've never I've even used their charging stations, but I really rate Fastned for their communication and their activity in the community. Chinese company BYD is next in the news, of course backed by Warren Buffett. They are offering a full suite of EV components to their car-making rivals and aspiring automakers to di diversify their own revenue streams and sources amid the slowing car demand in some places, says Bloomberg. 
Among the parts that the Shenzhen-based company makes and sells are the batteries, the powertrains, the lights. We had an online press conference on Sunday. BYD is China's biggest maker of vehicles over the last six years for new energy vehicles under the brand name Fin Dreams. They'll start a parts business. Last year, they signed an agreement with Toyota on EV battery supply and joint development. They also work with Daimler on making Denza branded EVs. And it's interesting to see a company that is known for making EVs get into the parts supply business and to know that actually some bits inside EVs will be from BYD, even if it's not made by the company that you bought the car off of. Something that we talk about on the podcast occasionally, one of the sponsors of this show and our premium partners is Avid Technology. They're a UK-based company and they do so much work to make EVs happen. Maybe not the car that you drive, but certainly a lot of the electric vehicles uh, that are out there. The parts underneath them, made by Avid. The technology that's been developed, made by Avid technology. Uh, You just might not realise because that's not the badge on the front of the vehicle. Let's move on. There's a company called Tropos Motors, or Tropos Motors, and they're beginning production in Europe, the European branch of a Californian EV maker. Tropos Motors has started making EVs in Germany. According to Electrive, up to 3,000 of these compact commercial vehicles are going to be made annually. The light transporters have a really small turning circle, adaptable body options, and they charge from the mains outlet as well. The vehicles are called ABLE, A-B-L-E, ABLE. They're 3.7 metres long and 1.4 metres wide. Yeah, I told you they were small. Net payload of 565 kilograms, and they've got this tiny turning circle as well. They'll be giving the Honda E a run for its money in terms of turning circles. Uh, The Able Standard has a a top speed of 80 kilometers, uh, sorry, of 40 kilometers an hour and a range of 80 kilometers. The Able XR with a bigger lithium-ion battery, uh, will go 260 kilometres and a top speed of 85 kilometres an hour. Yeah, I did tell you, these aren't exactly big vehicles or meant for the uh, highway. These are definitely small, urban delivery vehicles, last mile stuff that'd be really good for as well. They're dinky, cute little things, but awesome that 3,000 of them will be made in Germany by a Californian company. Well, two more stories on the podcast today. Tesla's Model Y performance is actually higher than that of the Model 3, even though it's not as quick. Let me explain. Power readings have been found by a YouTuber. uh, The channel on YouTube called Drag Times. He's a drag racing expert. His name is Brooks. I love his channel. Super interesting. And he's got a Model Y, and he's been taking it to the drag strip and measuring the power output of the electric motors. Of course, it's got two electric motors on the front and the rear. And according to Tesla Rati, he measured the vehicle's power output of the motors using a Bluetooth dongle and the Scan My Tesla app. Measurements on both of the motors on each of his vehicles, he's got a Model Y and a Model 3, reveal the front and rear motors on the Model Y are actually at the minute putting out more power than the motors on the Model 3. I think it's a fair assumption to say that the motors on the 3 and the Y are the same. I'm going to make that assumption that the actual motors on the front and the rear of the 3 and the Y are the same. And I'm not saying that's fact. I'm making that assumption because I think it's fair to make. The front motor of the Model Y has an output of 18 kilowatts more power than the 3, and the rear motor 15.5 kilowatts more than the 3. So what's happening here? Well, the Model Y is a heavier car. It's a bigger car. They are enabling those motors to output more power. It's an option, I suppose, that they are different motors for the Model Y. I don't know if anyone's stripped one down and looked at the parts numbers yet. I think they're probably going to be the same. There's a fair amount of articles online saying that the Model 3 and the Model Y share 75% of their parts. That was a stat, I think, from an Elon Musk tweet or or an earnings call two years ago. And the more I see of these two cars, the more I think that the 3 and the Y are massively different. I think that 75% thing is an urban myth these days. I don't think they share three quarters of the same parts. They can't. They just can't. There's so many different bits. Seats are the same. Not even the back seats. They even they go down in different ways. And so maybe the front seats, the steering wheel, the screen. But, you know, 73 quarters, 75%, I'm not sure anymore. I think that's that just gets repeated and uh, over and over again by 
news publications, and I'm not sure that's ever been fact-checked, by the way. So maybe the motors are different. If they're the same, Tesla have, have turned up the wick on the Y because it's a bigger car, because it's a heavier car. Is it unreasonable to take that jump? I hope I'm not doing two and two equals five here. That that means the Model 3 has got some in the tank. In other words, is there a time in the future when Tesla can say, A, we're making the 3 go faster, or B, for this many hundred dollars, we can make your Model 3 go faster, and they will unlock that power of the motors which they're currently using in the Y. We will see. Right, finally, a really good feel-good story to end on the podcast today. A Chicagoan... Are people from Chicago called Chicagoans? I think so. A Chicagoan called Neda Delami wanted to buy an EV, so she shopped around, uh, went to some dealerships, but the Nissan dealership she went to, she says, was frustrating because she'd done her research, and at the time when she bought her Leaf, she knew more than the salesperson, according to energynews.us. She recently traded in the Leaf, bought a Tesla, and had a different, different experience because it's an online purchase. As much as she likes her Tesla, she does feel strongly this lady from Chicago, that to promote the widespread adoption of EVs, some car dealers need to be more knowledgeable. So she developed a training and curriculum that she hopes will present to dealerships, up to 10 of them this year, and she wants them to uh, use her to train their salespeople about their work and what they need to do to sell EVs. Really, really interesting. Of course, regular listeners will hear that new partners of the podcast, uh, Porsche, of the village in Cincinnati and Audi of Cincinnati East. Of course, Porsche with the Taycan and Audi with the e-tron. That is obviously a dealership who, by sponsoring an EV podcast, they are very EV forward, very forward thinking. I reckon they're saying, I don't know. I've not been to Cincinnati, but clearly they're into their EVs. But there's got to be other dealerships where they need some upskilling. I've told the story before on this podcast about how when I bought my first Renault Zoe, I'd signed... That I'd signed the piece of paper that says I'll buy the car, uh, and we paid for it as well, by the way. Uh, I'd signed it, and as it was either before or after he handed us the key, but it was very late in the conversation. I'd bought the car, in other words. He said, oh, how are you going to charge it then? You know what? Nice guy, nice dealership, my local dealership. First car we'd bought from them. Uh, I'd never bought a Renault before, but, you know, it's, it's been there many years. In my previous life working in local radio, I'd worked with this dealership maybe 15 years ago. They're nice people, but that's terrible. <laughs> that's awful. So that's an example, perhaps, of how maybe earlier in the conversation they could have said to me, are you going to charge at home? Are you going to charge? that It charges at this speed, and this is what you'll need to charge. But anyway, they're lucky that I didn't. I didn't ask the question because I'm an EV nerd, so maybe... He just wanted to hit his targets, make a sale. I don't know. But that was not something that I would have left to the very last minute. To say, oh, yeah, uh, by the way, mate, how are you going to charge it then? (laughs) Don't worry, sunshine. I've got this. You get back to selling your fossil megans and stuff like that. Hey, uh, let's get on to our question of the week this week. With the Volkswagen ID3 facing software rewrites... How hard should we be on these legacy automakers when they hit EV speed bumps? Because at the minute, it's looking like it's going to be a rough and tumble ride for Volkswagen. They're making the they're making the cars, the VW ID3s, but they're having to put them into storage and park them up and then sort the software out later. Should we give them a hard time for this or an easy ride? What do you reckon? Email me, hello at evnewsdaily.com or leave a comment in the YouTube comments. Thank you to 242 patrons of the podcast for your generosity in in helping me make the show. There are uh, some premium partners like Phil Roberts of Electric Future, I want to thank. Uh, Brad Crosby, Avid Technology, Bright Smith Group for Clean Tech Talent, uh, Porsche of the Village Cincinnati, and Audi of Cincinnati East. And if you want to add your name to the list, maybe at $5 or $10 a month, I'll put your name in every show notes. For the price of a couple of posh coffees a month, you get to make this show happen. But no pressure. Of course, of course, I'll do it anyway. If you can leave a little review on Apple Podcasts, it helps me grow the show. 733 previous shows in the archive. Thanks to Patreon support, we get to carry on hosting those shows as a resource for anyone who wants to learn about EVs. That's where the Patreon money goes. Thank you very much for listening today. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.